Right, well, hello and welcome to the uh, second NCTA webinar. Uh, this is a webinar around optimising image quality. Uh, my name is James O'Connor. I'm um, a professor of radiology at the University of Manchester and I'll be chairing the webinar today and uh, invite Lucy uh, to give the first talk uh, reflecting on some of her experiences from the uh, PET Core Ladder Kings. Uh, thank you, Lucy. Thank you, James. Just share my screen here. Okay, hopefully everyone can see um, my slides. So my name is Lucy Pike. Um, I am a clinical scientist. I work at the PET Centre at St Thomas's Hospital. Um, I'm just going to give a little bit of background about the Core Lab. Um, how we do harmonization for multi-center studies um, and hopefully you can take some questions um, at the end if you have any. Um, so for those of you who may not be aware of us, the UK Pet Core Lab um, is based at the KCL and Guys and St. Thomas's Pet Center uh, where we've been located since 2002. Um, we've recently been endorsed by the British Nuclear Medicine Society um, and the core lab was originally set up um, to support multi-center lymphoma trials um, run from St. Thomas's Hospital. Um, and it sort of evolved from there and we currently um, support quite a number of um, oncology multi-center trials. Um, the uh, core lab is co-led by um, professors Paul Marsden and Sally Barrington. Um, we have uh, regular clinical support from Marlene Fisher and Victoria Warby, and we have a, a team of physicists now, um, sort of overseen by me on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but we've got Alice, Serka, and uh, Georgios um, all helping out. Um, so we have basically, throughout the number of years that we've working, developed and implemented a series of standards for performing PET studies in multi-center trials. Uh, when we started, no uh, standards really existed. Um, these have evolved and there's quite clear uh, guidelines now that have been um, published and are adopted in uh, Europe-wide and in the US. Um, and here in the UK, we've been accrediting um, centers for some time um, with the idea to set up a network of cent pet centers that are all working to a similar standard that was agreed um, along with a, a panel of pet experts. Um, we've also, as well as the UK centres, we've accredited a number of non-UK centres and helped to set up core labs um, abroad. Most recently we've been working with Australian sites, um, but we've certainly been working with centres all over Europe. Um, just to give you an idea of how this sort of evolved, um, when we first started, I started the core lab in 2009, but um, physicists were accrediting centres before then. We had a, a very small number of centres, so it was relatively easy to sort of work out how to set up the accreditation process. Um, but we now have over 60 PET scanners. Um, that we regularly perform um, accreditation for um, across the UK. Um, one thing to note is that the number of manufacturers is quite small. Um, in the UK, we only have Siemens and GE. We do have some accredited Philips scanners outside of the UK, um, but there's a range of models and a range of ages. So there is a little bit of work um, sort of trying to harmonize, harmonize from the oldest systems to the newest systems. Um, one other part of what we do as part of the core lab is we actually collate um, the PET data. Um, so one thing that we've always felt is it's one stage to accredit the centers and get them up to a certain standard. But we want to make sure that the data that we are getting, um, which is obviously very important, is actually up to um, the correct standard. So we work with the um, principal investigator and the clinical trials labs, um, offices, sorry, and we um, collate all the data. So the trials office will let us know when patients are recruited into the study and we will liaise with the scanning sites to collate the data. 
we will make sure that they are appropriately pseudo anonymized, um, that all the information you need to do quantification is present, and that they have acquired the scans according to the trial protocol. We can then feed that back to the principal investigator if there is any issues. And hopefully, because we're doing this pretty much real time, we can actually um, address issues before they become um, severe. Um, the last stage would then be to upload data for central review. So we don't, unless there are our own studies, we don't tend to actually analyze and report the studies ourselves. Um, so our funding model at the moment works on a per trial basis. Um, so we basically, funding for staffing, for consumables, equipment and so on, is through each trial that we support. Um, so what happens is we have a sort of a standard form. We ask the um, chief investigator to complete this. Um, and it just gives us a little bit of background about the trial, how big it might be, um, what sort of uh, requirements they might have. Is it standard FDG half body PET CT or do they have something more complex which we can account for? Um, and we provide a costing. So um, that's generally dependent on the complexity of the imaging, um, the number of sites that are involved and how many scans they're going to be performing per patient. Um, we then set up, if they're happy to obviously fund that, we would set up a service level agreement uh, with the sponsor so that we can cover all the sort of data protection, GDPR type issues as well. Um, we work with the trials team to develop the imaging manuals. Um, so usually there'll be a sort of a clinical pe expert from the trial itself who we will work with to look, look at sort of specific um, requirements for patient preparation and so on. Um, and we work closely with the trial coordinators to make sure that um, we synchronize opening of sites with the accreditation um, so that they're ready to scan patients as soon as the site's open to recruitment. Um, and then we'll perform this uh, site accreditation and technical QC for the um, duration of the trial. Um, and there's obviously sort of a little bit of back and forth during the um, assessment and write up of the study at the end as well, which we can provide feedback on. Um, so many of you probably all know very well about PET imaging, but just to give you a little bit of background before I talk a bit more of the technical processes. So PET is a quantitative imaging technique and um, what you're seeing on the screen um, in terms of the voxel values is a measure of the activity concentration in the different organs and tissues. Um, there are two sort of general ways of scanning. One can be either doing static scans, which take a snapshot of uptake at a specific time point, or you might be doing dynamic scans where you're interested in looking at the change of distribution in the tracer over time. Um, so there's a number of factors affecting pet uptake. Um, from the initial sort of equipment opt, um, that is used. Um, this not only includes the PET scanner itself, but ancillary equipment such as the calibrator used to measure the patient injection, patient weighing scales if you're normalizing um, the activity um, concentration by patient weight, um, the clocks because traces are decaying and so on. Um, patient preparation can be very important as well. Um, so for example, in the case of FDG, um, fasting is very important, measuring the blood glucose, um, how much in activity is injected, how well um, the injection is, whether there's tissueing. Um, and then through to the scan, how the scan is performed itself, what uptake time, what parameters are used. Um, and how you actually position the patient and what reconstruction and so on you use. Finally, how you actually um, analyze the data um, from simple clinical sort of measures to more complex uh, ROI, textural features and so on. How this is done obviously needs to be sort of standardized. Um, so looking at the, what, how we actually manage to um, have standards on this and match scanners. Um, as part of the accreditation process, sites are asked to have a minimum level of QC. 
Um, we've based this on um, published guidance and regulatory requirements. And this covers, like I say, the PET and the CT, as well as some of the ancillary equipment that may impact on um, quantification with the PET. Um, and we assess the compliance of this via sub getting sites to submit questionnaires, um, providing evidence of having a quality assurance system and um, samples of QC results. Uh, the next stage um, for looking at how to uh, standardize patient preparation is really done through having um, a specific imaging manual for the trial. Like I say, we get in input from the clinical expert, but we, because we've done a lot of trials, we've sort of got a, a template where we know areas that people struggle with or questions are often asked. So we do try to sort of make it quite clear which factors are critical for the running of the study or for trial outcomes so that, you know, small issues are perhaps um, not um, emphasized, but we do make sure that there's no issues where patients might end up being excluded based on the um, issue, an issue with the PET scan. Uh, we also ask sites to complete a pet acquisition form at the time of the scan, which gives us information that we can't get from the images themselves. And these are reviewed along with the pet scans that we receive each time. And we can do various checks based on the DICOM header of the scan. Um, and we also do sort of visual assessments. The accreditation of the PET scanners is done using standardized phantoms. Um, and we use um, we generally start with the clinical parameters that each site uses to see if those are sufficient for uh, participating in the trial. And then we feed back to the sites, if that's not the case, what parameters they might need to change in order to bring themselves to, um, into the same sort of standard as the other centres in the, in the study. Um, once sites are set up as part of their initial accreditation, we then ask them to submit a repeated phantom scan each year. Um, and we do an ongoing uh, review of the clinical, of the trial scans um, to make sure those parameters that we agreed with the site are actually being used ongoing. Um, <clears throat> so this is just a quick um, view of the phantom that we use. It's a widely available phantom because it's used of in commissioning uh, PET scanners. Um, and it is also actually the same phantom that's used by uh, European and Australian accreditation schemes. So if sites are in other accreditation schemes, we can try to minimize the amount of work that they need to do. Um, and we analyze all this data at St. Thomas's and we've got a sort of automated uh, software to do that. Um, as you can just briefly see on this picture, um, basically there are six hot spheres in the phantom and a uniform background. Um, and depending on the parameters that the site uses, you can certainly see from the top left to the bottom right, um, the smallest sphere um, appears to sort of um, become much brighter. So we need to make sure that we match between uh, different sites because visually I can see a difference here, but also quantitatively, you will be picking up different measures for activity concentration. So um, what we do is we measure the six spheres in the phantom um, using uh, standard uh, measurements. Um, and we try and match that between each center. And this is basically giving us um, an idea of the response of the system. And the sort of the ideal response would be that each of those spheres would read the exact activity concentration that was in them. So you would have a re what we would call a recovery coefficient, which is the measured divided by the true activity concentration of one, regardless of the size of the blob that you're imaging. Um, but because of loss of resolution in the system, this isn't, doesn't happen. So we get something that looks a bit more like this curve here, where as the um, object you're imaging gets smaller, you're less able to pick up the true activity um, within the image. And we want to try and basically, we accept that there is a bias, that um, we have to um, live with that, that smaller objects are not resolved as well. Um, but what we want to really do is minimize this variance by matching this curve as best we can between all the systems. 
Um, the final part um, of the process um, is uh, standardization of the analysis at the end. Um, often the analysis technique is actually part of the trial objective, so um, it may not always be obvious the exact way that you will be doing um, the analysis until you get the data. Um, but we always recommend that uh, researchers use centralized analysis. Um, this means that you've got a single software that's well controlled um, and you've got set reviewers as opposed to if you had a larger study um, and data is sort of reviewed at each site, perhaps that can um, cause variation across um, the data that you receive. Um, where there are multiple reporters, making sure that um, there is some sort of standardized analysis or reporting criteria used and that these are clear. And ideally to do some sort of audit um, whereby you send around a, a set of scans or a set of phantom scans or patient scans where each reviewer takes some measurements so that you can see that um, you're getting a similar result. Um, so in terms of the core lab, we're able to help with this process. Um, we have digital phantoms, uh, real phantom scans and so on. Um, we test our own software. Each time we get an upgrade to it, we retest it to make sure that we're getting constant uh, values when we're doing analysis of um, data. Um, we can also help to facilitate audits. So if you want um, us to sort of help with selection of a, a set of scans that are then uh, completely anonymized and sent to the different reviewers and then um, collated um, collation of the results um, and this has worked quite well for us particularly on sort of large international studies where it's not feasible to have only one center um, reviewing the PET scans. Um, there are other networks out there I wasn't going to go into a huge amount of detail about each of them um, but certainly um, most studies we do are mainly UK based. We have some studies where we tend to have um, majority UK centres and then a few centres in Europe. Um, when we do larger, more international studies, what tends to happen is, um, so for example, if it was with the US, the US sites would be all accredited and managed through something like the uh, SNM Clinical Trials Network or ACRIN or one of the US uh, bodies. And we would look after the UK sites because it's not really feasible for us to put in um, a lot of uh, replicated work to accredit the sites that are already accredited by the other center. So we do liaise a lot, particularly with um, EARL, which is the European Accreditation Scheme. Um, and we've got a lot of um, collaboration with Australian sites. Um, one thing to note is that these large American and European study uh, accreditation uh, labs only really provide accreditation. They don't tend, to, they don't, as far as I know, um, collate data um, and provide that side of it. They don't have a sort of a feedback or real time data review process. Um, so that's one little difference between us and them. So um, you could sign up um, and get accreditation from these uh, users. They do charge um, on a per scanner basis. So their models tend to work in the sense that um, a pet centre itself would tend to pay for the accreditation rather than the trial. Um, and that would mean that they can then um, use their accreditation across multiple trials. Whereas our model is that the trial is paying for the accreditation. So we only provide accreditation for the trials that um, we have contracts with. Um, there's obviously also commercial companies that provide accreditation um, and they will also collate data. Um, and there are sort of other harmonization schemes that I'm aware of, in particular the Dementias Platform UK project that's looking at um, harmonization of PETMR. Um, so I'll finish um, talking now. We have got a pet. Um, a website for the pet core lab um, so we do try to keep this up to date it's got some information about um, how the accreditation works um, 
what trials we're currently working on and so on and the contact details if there are any other researchers that are interested in working with us can obviously um, email us directly on our uh, email at the top there pet-trials at kcl.acu.uk thank you thank you lucy um, so um that's a great uh, introduction for us um, i should say um that we'll take questions at the end and um, if you want to submit questions please uh, to indicate to me if um you don't want to uh, ask the question yourself um, um i will now move on to john Watson, who will share right Okay, so uh, I've, that was a great talk, Lucy. I've got a slightly different style here. Um, so uh, first of all, my disclosures, but I'll also use this to uh, mention uh, Bioxidine. So I, in addition to my role at the University of Manchester, I have a role with Bioxidine, which is a CRO, um, which has very much the same kind of role for MRI trials, particularly uh, DCMRI, OEMRI, and so on, um, as Lucy described for PET, but with the big difference that uh, bioxidine as a CRO tends to work on a, um, on a per trial basis. And there isn't this uh, infrastructure that's been set up in the PET community. I think many people would say that uh, MRI is a long way behind uh, PET. And so I'd like to use these few minutes to uh, say why that uh, might be. So I'd like to start off with a little story. Um, I spent many years working in the pharma industry and uh, one day in the coffee queue, um, I, uh, uh, all the best projects start in the coffee queue, don't they? So uh, a colleague uh, came up to me in the coffee queue and uh, asked me, uh, she was starting a, an enhanced permeability and retention project. And she wants to know which uh, tumour types she should be working on um, to try her, uh, her EPR uh, ideas out on. So uh, she asked me in the coffee queue whether I knew which tumours had highest permeability. And so I immediately answered, well, that's what CT and MR have been doing for, uh, for years. So uh, I started waffling on about MRI and K-trans and went to the literature. And then I realized and was rather shocked by the fact that I couldn't make any kind of hierarchy of K-trans values from the literature. Um, many of the studies that report K-trans only report changes, they don't report baseline. And because there was such a huge heterogeneity of methodology and models, there were orders of magnitude difference between K-trans uh, values for, uh, for different studies. So uh, as any good uh, academic does, we uh, designed an experiment to answer my colleague's question. And uh, uh, working with uh, James and Jeff Parker and others at the University of Manchester, we went back to 18 previously uh, performed studies with over 300 tumours and reanalyzed them all with, an, with a standardised extended TOFS model and wrote the paper. And uh, so here are four tumours, uh, gliomas, uh, liver, uh, uh, colorectal, pelvis, ovarian, and we have a, a low, medium and high K-trans in each case. And uh, the conclusion we came to in the paper was that gliomas have much lower K-trans than everything else, which was a bit of a surprise because Radiologists will tell you that GBMs have got very high permeability. Um, but also every other tumour, um, you can't really distinguish them on the basis of permeability. And so we said K-trans is an idiopathic perme uh, parameter. And if you need to find high K-trans tumours, you should just use that as a, uh, a use K-trans as a, an inclusion criterion. And I wanted to start off by telling that story it's a bit of a, a horror story um, uh, in that this biomarker has now been around for nearly 30 years. And uh, the fact that I couldn't go to the literature and find biomarker values was, was I think, rather shocking and doesn't reflect very well on the, on the MR community. 
Okay, so next slide. Sorry. So uh, biomarkers are assays, and assays need quality management. And there is a whole uh, of vocabulary and uh, terminology and process around uh, quality management. So um, there is a, I think there's a difference between the different imaging modalities of the culture and the way they've grown up. So there are some uh, imaging modalities which either use ionizing radiation or they inject uh, a drug which does not have uh, uh, regulatory approval, a tracer, for example. And there, the whole culture has been to do uh, standardization, dosimetry, pharmacokinetics. And if you don't do those things, then people go to prison. So PET and CT are intrinsically very well standardized and uh, uh, very well locked down and anything where you use a, a non-regulated drug uh, tends to intrinsically be very uh, very locked down. Uh, MR on the other hand particularly when you're doing non-injections the culture has been that um, uh, grad students and, uh, and postdocs uh, try things out they give it a whirl they jump into the scanner themselves and um, standardization is something that's uh, boring and tedious and is left uh, for somebody else to do later and that culture i think has left us with a lot of very bad practices which are great for moving fast into single center trials in single expert centers and we can move very rapidly there but terrible when we want to work in a multi-center multi-vendor environment um, Contrast enhanced MRI, we used to think MR contrast agents were safe, but we now don't think that quite as much. But even so, if we're using a standard radiologic contrast medium, the level of standardization and uh, quality management we use would probably be not as mature as in, in PET. So um, this is not new. Uh, T1 in MR was arguably, it was what caused MR to be invented based on Raymond Damadian's paper from 1971. So we're talking about uh, an imaging biomarker in the case of T1, which is nearly 50 years old. So we, we shouldn't really be uh, still struggling with this. Um, imaging biomarkers uh, fall into three categories. The first category I would call how ugly, or in statistical speak, ordered categoricals, radiologic scores, for example, TNM and so on. The second would be how big, things like uh, tumor volumes, cyst uh, sizes and so on. These are extensive variables in uh, statistics speak. And then finally, the intensive variables, how hot, uh, in colloquial terms, such as T1 or ADC or K trans. And those are standardized in different ways, and the quality management is very different. So, for how ugly biomarkers, there are curated imaging sets, training programs, accreditation, and so on. For how big biomarkers, we use structural phantoms, and these are often very similar to the ones you might see in CT or PET or ultrasound. But for the how hot biomarkers, um, we often have to devise both real and digital phantoms separately for each biomarker and then devise separate acquisition protocols, analysis and uh, SOPs. Um, and moreover, not all of the how hot biomarkers are uh, create, created equal. So I've made a, a fairly random list of how hot uh, MR biomarkers and at the top I've put things like ADC diffusion coefficient which is undergraduate physics or rate of return to Boltzmann equilibrium which is probably A level physics um, and these are pretty well defined all the way through to things like tumor blood flow, PO2, K trans, T2 which are uh, it may also be fairly well defined, but have some really nasty, uh, tricky confounds, right through to things like radiomic signatures, which are uh, rather poorly defined. And so there is a gradation between uh, 
if you like, easy physics and uh, more difficult physics. So if you want to go out and buy a phantom, so if you go on to phantom, you can find a lot of phantoms and you can find a lot of companies. Uh, this is not, uh, this is not a, a, a well uh, standardized space. Um, and in general, I think you can, if you're looking at uh, phantoms, uh, again, not all phantoms are created equal. A lot of labs just develop their own phantom. Uh, maybe a grad student will develop their phantom for their PhD project. Um, the next stage up the iteration is where you, you develop a phantom, you put some effort into it, you publish it. And then moving up uh, to a higher level still, you prospectively design the phantom and validate it according to a, a validation process. And ideally you have metrologists, maybe the National Metrology Organization like the NPL or NIST and statisticians in the core team from the get go so that you have something that uh, is respectable from a metrology point of view. Um, so if we look at MR, there are uh, several uh, phantoms that are around that have, have, uh, have been uh, uh, well established. So the, uh, the ISMRM NIST phantom, which uh, had a lot of input from the US standards organization, the European uh, Eurospin phantom, which came out from an early, uh, uh, early framework program, uh, the T1 MES phantom, which the cardiologists use for T1 measurements, ACR and so on. Um, but even right at the very top of my list, if you look at R1, uh, there, this is a, a list of the uh, features of an ideal R1 phantom. And I'm not going to take you through all of it, but if you, if you simply uh, look at the size of that list, you'll realize that there are an awful lot of uh, uh, really uh, uh, difficult um, things to, to, to uh, design into a phantom. And many of them are, um, uh, are conflicting. So things like temperature control is, is uh, difficult. You can use ice water phantoms, but then ice water phantoms are not convenient in radiology departments because radiology departments may not have ice or the ice may melt. Um, if you want to uh, interrogate the whole uh, area of the phantom, then you, uh, you need, uh, 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 maybe you need flood phantoms, but as, Physicists know flood phantoms um, have got all kinds of problems like radiation damping and convection and self diffusion and standing waves and blah de blah de blah de blah de blah. So, even 50 years on, uh, designing an ideal R1 phantom is still, I would posit, an unsolved problem, um, which is a bit embarrassing for MR, really. Um, okay, so why, uh, why are we still struggling? So um, the, I would argue that one of the main problems is poorly aligned incentives. So oncologists are not gonna use uh, MR biomarkers for decision-making in multi-center trials unless they have confidence that the measurements are accurate in the way that Lucy has given uh, oncologists uh, uh, confidence with her uh, uh, PET uh, facility. But uh, raid, uh, vendors are not going to build in uh, accuracy into MR scanners unless their customers, who are the radiologists who pay the, who sign the checks, are demanding it. But radiologists are not really going to demand accurate P1 or ADC or K trans measurements unless there's some evidence base that shows you that those uh, that accurate biomarker measurements are going to help patients and lead to better health outcomes. But that evidence base doesn't exist because the scanners don't routinely generate accurate measurements. So there is a, uh, a nasty uh, vicious circle and uh, it's even worse than that because uh, standardization isn't sexy, funding agencies are not very interested in it, it's not considered innovative and uh, a lot of academics find that it's not very career enhancing either because it doesn't lead to uh, four star papers at REF. Okay, so what to do? So over the last, I suppose, 15 years, 
there have been a number of um, initiatives, uh, some of which are more mature than others, to standardise. And these, the general features here is the public-private partnerships, they involve both businesses who don't have to worry about REF, uh, academics uh, who can um, address uh, the, the more uh, academic aspects and ideally statisticians and metrologists. Um, I, I, and uh, in the US, FNIH, Kiba, uh, in Europe, uh, IMI has been very, very active uh, with a number of different IMI projects. I think uh, I, I would suggest as a starting point, uh, the role of academics is to innovate and actually it's the role of businesses uh, to standardise, not academics. So I'll give you a couple of examples of uh, where uh, uh, IMI has done some standardisation. Uh, this is a, uh, a project uh, looking at uh, imaging biomarkers for drug safety. Um, I just put this up. Uh, you can just see the number of logos on the uh, title slide, which uh, tells you how many institutions are involved. And that would have probably been difficult to do with uh, academic funding. This is five uh, uh, analytically verified agarose phantoms, the different R1, which were taken around to a dozen centres at different field strengths. And uh, Rather uh, delightfully, the, uh, the R1 uh, values were, uh, uh, were much more uh, reproducibility than we feared at the outset. Indeed, our coefficients of variation were in the, the 1 to 2 percent range, and most of that was probably accounted for simply by the fit error, which was probably driven by the signal to noise of the scanner. So we were actually delighted and surprised that uh, R1 was. Uh, in our study, uh, pretty reproducible across scanners. I mean, I have to say that, uh, I mean, this was a saturation recovery technique. I have to say the clinical data using variable flip angle from uh, Kathy Keenan with the NIST phantom have not been as encouraging. And I think there is clearly work to do in the clinical space, particularly with uh, VFA techniques. Another example, uh, ADC. This is a neat ice water phantom. It's actually really difficult to do ice water phantoms for animal scanners because of the uh, risk that the ice melts while you're still doing the scan. But nonetheless, we got reasonably good agreement across seven scanners. Reasonable, although uh, I would not say as, as uh, reassuring as we saw with the uh, R1 phantom, particularly because ADC itself uh, it doesn't have a great dynamic range and so uh, ADC uh, changes need uh, quite good um, uh, quite good precision and accuracy. Um, so I wanted to uh, I wanted to bring that to a close and summarize uh, by um, uh, by uh, saying first of all that standardization uh, particularly where you're talking about intensive variables, K-trans, PO2, T1, uh, T2, ADC, is a hard problem. And uh, it's, it, although it's uh, not regarded by innovators as being a very respectable or sexy problem, it is still a hard problem. And in many ways, I would say it's an unsolved problem. There's the issue of phantoms and metrology. There's the issue that nobody really wants to pay for the work. Um, and this does limit our ability to translate, particularly in going from single center, single vendor, vendor expert sites through to multi-center, multi-vendor, which is absolutely critical in oncology uh, because working multi-center, particularly in rare tumors, is absolutely critical. And then um, I'd, I'd like to draw your attention to the need for alternative funding where academics might be participants but not necessarily leaders and where uh, businesses uh, need to be playing a um, uh, playing a, uh, a, 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 a an equal role as participants so that's all i have to say and i'm very happy to take questions at the end thank you john and so we'll now move on uh, to matey who's going to 
uh, talk about some of these issues in the context of uh, the NCTA infrastructure. Thank you, Maisie. Thank you. I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, thank you, James. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Maite Jauregui and I am the QAQC manager within NCITA. I've been in NCITA for just over six months and today I just want to introduce the Q QAQC units to you, give you an idea of what it is that we want to achieve and tell you a bit uh, what we've done so far. So I want to start by putting things into context a bit and um, talk about the current situation with imaging biomarkers. So, as you all know, imaging is used in diagnosis, treatment planning, and management of cancer patients. And we already have imaging biomarkers that allow the assessment of microstructural, functional, and metabolic changes associated with cancer. Some of these imaging biomarkers actually do have the potential to change clinical practice. So, what's the issue here? Well, most of them, at the moment, they have incomplete validation. And for an imaging biomarker to be adopted by either the NHS or the pharma industry, it needs to have the biological, technical, and clinical validation confirmed. And this is not an easy task, and it requires an interdisciplinary and a collaborative approach. Another issue we have is that the infrastructure needed to develop and validate imaging biomarkers is scarce, and where it exists is not actually very efficient. So there is often duplication across different sites, and there isn't a very effective cross-site coordination. And on top of this, this infrastructure support that's needed hasn't really been recognized as a priority. And this has led to this adoption by the clinic even more difficult. So what is it that we are trying to do within NCITA? Well, NCITA aims to establish the infrastructure to bridge the translational gap and to enable coordination between, between complementary local structures in order to provide a unified mechanism for imaging biomarker validation. So in essence, what we want to do is to provision the translational pipeline that was described in the imaging biomarker roadmap for cancer studies that was led by James. So the NCITA infrastructure is collaborative. It involves seven institutions across the UK, but at the same time is centrally managed. And it represents the first coordinated UK National Cancer Imaging Network. It's a natural evolution of the Cancer Imaging Center initiative. And as such, it provides a pathway for clinical impacts to be derived from the imaging biomarkers that were conceived as part of that CIC initiative. So within NCIDA, we have three cross-institutional interactive units. So we have the QAQC units, the trials unit, and the repository unit. And as you can see here, the different units will support studies that span across the translational pipeline. So the QAQC unit, which I manage, will support studies from first in human all the way to multi-center reproducibility assessment and will focus on the validation, standardization, and QAQC in order to work towards the certification of imaging biomarkers. The trials unit, which is managed by Nicola, has expertise in imaging trials, um, imaging-specific trial design, and will also provide statistical support, and as such will contribute to imaging biomarker validation. And finally, the repository unit that is managed by Simon will facilitate multi-center studies because it will avoid the duplication of effort as it will allow investigators to be sharing their data sets with the wider imaging community and like that facilitate the discovery of imaging biomarkers. Now, we have about 40 or 45 investigators across the host institutions who locally integrate and manage infrastructure posts related to these three units that I mentioned. And for any given study, you can expect that there will be certain tasks that will be exclusively performed by one of the units. But for some other tasks, the different units will need to liaise and work collaboratively. So if we focus on QAQC specifically now, so what are the challenges here? Well, this emerging role of imaging biomarkers requires studies to produce reliable results that can then be used to assess disease status. But ensuring such consistency in multi-center studies that use imaging is very challenging 
One of the reasons being that acquisition and reconstruction are often performed in many different settings and very often using different instrumentation. So there are two main processes that are important to reduce the variability of results. So one of them is the standardization of imaging protocols, but another one is the verification that imaging instruments themselves are performing according to specifications. That is to say that they are properly calibrated. So if there isn't a common imaging procedure in place, you can expect uh, a large variability between imaging endpoints acquired from different scanners. But at the same time, we know that different scanners with their associated analysis platforms cannot always use the same a priori parameters because of differences in algorithms or the implementation. So this has led to the concept of harmonized image acquisition and analysis, where you first specify a set of parameters that you then use to define the acquisition, reconstruction, and analysis for the different instruments. So what does this mean? So this means that in a multi-center study, different sites can use different scanners as long as they are used, calibrated, and set in such a way that in the end, the results from the different scanners can all be compared. Uh, in multi center studies, you also have an added complication that you may have scanners uh, whose hardware and software technologies also differ by, let's say, a decade. And the difference in, per in performance because of this difference in age also poses a challenge when you are trying to define standards. So there are several um, professional organizations and societies promoting harmonization in order to reduce the variability of quantitative imaging in multicenter studies. So I have listed a few here. And there are some initiatives uh, that also provide quality control programs in order to ensure quantitative comparability. So let's have a quick look at the international landscape. So in the United States, we have Kiva that was established in 2007. And this brings together radiologists, imaging scientists, and industry representatives that work together in order to promote the use of quantitative imaging in both research and clinical setting. And they publish publicly reviewed profiles. So you can see at the moment there are three technically confirmed profiles, two uh, regarding CT and one for FDG PET CT. And they have seven consensus profiles um, that involve different imaging technologies. Now, if you check the dates, you can see that they are all relatively recent, um, even though, for example, FDG PET CT has been used uh, for many years now. So this gives you an idea of how complicated it is to get to the point of having a technically confirmed profile. And it highlights the fact that the imaging community needs to work collaboratively to achieve this. In America, again, they have the American College of Radiology Imaging Network. And this was initially developed to ensure that individual PET scanners were properly calibrated, but then they moved on and then built um, two core labs, a PET core lab in 2003, and an MRI core lab in 2006. The Clinical Trials Network, established in 2008, uh, again, they have a standard validation program, they have standardized imaging protocols, and offer uh, training for site personnel. But what I wanted to highlight here is the fact that they also help facilitate the use of radiopharmaceuticals in clinical trials by coordinating, standardizing, and also educating about the drug development process and how to obtain regulatory approval. And I think this is something that would be really beneficial for the UK. So even though we have a different system here, I think it would be good to have something similar for the UK. Uh, they maintain a database of qualified imaging sites and tracer manufacturers, and to date they have over 500 sites registered. Uh, and finally, in the States, another key player when it comes to quantitative imaging, uh, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And what I wanted to highlight here is that they have started a phantom lending library, which I think is very interesting for multicenter studies. At the moment, they have two system phantoms and two diffusion phantoms, but they are willing to expand the list uh, depending, to, depending on customer requirements and needs. 
So what do we have in Europe? Um, as Lucy mentioned earlier, we have EARL that was established in 2006, and in 2010 they created this FDG Pet CT accreditation program. So they accredit Pet CT scanners in Europe, but they do not have an accreditation program for SPECT cameras. In the UK, EARL is not very widespread. I believe there's only six scanners that are accredited by the EARL. But again, this varies from country to country. So in Estonia, for example, if you want national insurance to pay for the PET CT scan of a patient, uh, the scanner must be accredited by the EARL. It must re uh, produce the EARL reconstruction and have it available if needed. So as I said, that depends on in the individual countries in Europe. The European Imaging Biomarkers Alliance, they facilitate imaging biomarker development and standardization and promote the use of imaging biomarkers in trials. But what I wanted to highlight here is that a few years ago in their mission statement, one of the tasks they wanted to take forward was to establish methods or SOPs for center accreditation in MRI. Now, to my knowledge, this hasn't happened, but I think it's a very interesting statement. Mm -hmm. And the European Organization for Research and Treatment of Cancer, here they have a subcommittee dedicated to QA within the imaging group. And from their point, standardization is attempted at the level of protocol implementation, but it's not enforced. And according to them, they don't even have sufficient resources for QA. And again, this, I think, is an interesting statement. So in the UK, we have the UK Pet Core Lab that Lucy introduced earlier, and the Radiotherapy Trials Quality Assurance Group that provides QA for trials that have a radiotherapy component, and also NPL uh, in Teddington that also contributes to the development and translation of new imaging technologies by doing phantom work and providing metrology. So, as you can see, there are lots of groups, lots of organizations, all trying to promote harmonization, standardization, and some sort of quality assurance or quality control. But it's quite clear that when you compare PET and MRI, that MRI is behind PET um, for many reasons, some of which uh, John has outlined earlier. One of the reasons here is also that MRI, the way it's currently used in the clinic, is inherently non-quantitative. But having said that, MRI is moving towards being quantitative. And that means that the way QA and QC is done probably needs to change. Because if you check the literature and you read the papers, you see that everyone is recognizing that ongoing QA and QC are essential. However, reality doesn't always reflect uh, what the papers say. Or I think there is a mismatch between what's been said that should be done and what actually happens and the imaging community should try to bridge that gap. So in the annual reports, the NCRI Imaging Advisory Group a few years ago expressed the need to develop an MRI core lab for QA purposes and promote imaging standardization. And I think the NCTA QA QC unit is very well placed to contribute to this. And actually one of our objectives is to establish an MRI core lab in the UK. So who is in unit? So the unit is led by Eric, uh, based at Imperial, and managed by myself, also based, based at Imperial. And the different team members are across the host institutions. So we have Damien and Penny in Manchester that have experience in MRI and quantitative imaging. We have Arnold in Cambridge, who focuses on hyperpolarized MRI. Matt at the ICR, who knows about signal and data processing. And we will soon be getting a new member of the team in Oxford, a pet radiographer, so we are looking forward to that. We have Tom in KCL, who has experience in growing 3D patient derived organoids, and Jen also at KCL, who has experience in GMP and radio pharmacy. So the different team members link the existing infrastructure and expertise in their host institution to the NCTA network. And the activities of the unit are overseen and also supported by the QAQC management board, the composition of which, um, as you can see down here, also represents the cross institutional composition of NCTA. So, as you can see, the various team members have different skill sets. 
And so you may be wondering why if we are trying to establish an MRI for lab, not everyone is an MRI physicist, um, but there is a reason for this. So if you are planning an imaging study, uh, first you would draft a protocol where you say what it is that you're going to investigate, how you are going to investigate it, and so on. Now, this imaging study will have or may have several components or aspects to it, the main one being the imaging component. So the NCTA QAQC unit will contribute to the imaging aspect of MRI studies that are adopted by NCTA. And to this end, we are currently defining the processes and drafting the associated documentation in order to be able to provide such support. So what does this support involve uh, at this stage of the process, so before the study begins? So from the study protocol, you need to draft an imaging manual to capture the more specific details of the imaging process itself. So in multi-center studies, for sites interested in taking part, then we would send an imaging site questionnaire in order to document the personnel, the infrastructure and the facilities in order to ensure that the site meets their requirements to take part in the study and that they can acquire scans that are of sufficient quality. Then the site would acquire phantom and maybe volunteer data to check the performance of the scanner and then we would also have to establish the um, data transfer pipelines and then we would check the phantom or volunteer data and then feed back to the site and provide site-specific imaging manuals or documentation before the site can be confirmed for the study. And this again is part of the process of ensuring that then at the end of the study all the results from the different scanners can be compared. But this imaging aspect may not be the only aspect of the study. Very often, imaging studies have a pathology aspect associated um, in order to, ex to check the relationship between what's being measured in the scan and the patient samples. So again, the process here is relatively similar. So from the study protocol, a pathology manual would have to be drafted. And one of the first questions you would need to ask in a multi-center study is, is the testing gonna be done at one central lab or is it gonna be performed at various sites? Now, if the testing is done at central lab, you would need to ensure that the site is either accredited, accredited or has sufficient quality to act as a central lab. And the QA, QC unit will support that assessment. And if the test is widely available and it's gonna be performed at various sites, then it's important that the process is standardized across the different sites because even though medical laboratories will be following certain quality standards and there may be regulations they need to comply with, there are many factors that can affect the variability of the results, such as how you are preparing your samples and storing your samples before you analyze them, or even post-analytical variables such a, that may be the consequence of the subjective assessment of the pathologists. So in this case, we may have to estimate the degree of variability by measuring the inter and intra observer agreement level of pathologists. So all these processes require some sort of standardization and the unit will provide that support for NCTA adopted studies. Um, and finally, another component that imaging studies may have is the imaging agent. So this may be a PET uh, tracer, or a SPECT tracer, or an MRI contrast agent. Now again, this imaging agent may be produced at a single site or at different sites um, of the taking part in the study. Now again, when it comes to manufacturing of drugs, this will be produced to GMP standards. So there will be certain standards that will be kept uh, for all the sites. However, uh, you may have to standardize or even come to a consensus when it comes to other aspects. So to give you an example, if you are trying to do a multi-center study with hyperpolarized MRI contrast agents, even though the kits to be hyperpolarized may be, well, will be manufactured and released by a radio pharmacy, the actual hyperpolarization and subsequent QC and release for patient injection will be outside the radio pharmacy's remit. And this is something that will need to be performed at all the participating sites because of the short life of the hyperpolarized MRI conjugate agent. 
and it's important that this process is developed, validated, and standardized across all the sites. So again, this is something that the unit will be contributing to. So during the study, the images need to be acquired by the participating sites, but then these images need to be managed, and the scans that have been acquired need to undergo some QC checks. If something is not quite right or you have an out-of-specification result, then corrective action and preventative action needs to be implemented. And throughout the study, you need to have some sort of monitoring system to ensure compliance both with the protocol and with the quality standards that you have set. And you need to maintain the qualification and accreditation or accreditation status of the scanner. So again, at the moment, we are defining these processes in order to be able to provide this support for the studies. And then finally, after the study is done, the data needs to be transferred, analyzed, and archived or sent to the repository. So as you can see, there are many different aspects that the unit will be able to contribute once our processes are in place. And what happens during a study actually follows the process approach, where you first plan and you say what it is that you are going to do. Then you do what you said you were going to do. Then you check that you are actually doing what you said you were going to do. And if that's not quite right, then you act to correct it. And the way you act is, again, in a planned way, repeating the cycle. Now, this approach is promoted and supported by quality management systems. And despite the fact that quality management systems have been adopted by many industries, their adoption within the clinical development has proven very challenging. And I personally think that having a proper quality management system in place would facilitate the managing the complexity of multicenter studies. So why is this? Sorry. Um, quality management systems, or QMS for short, support a paradigm shift from being reactive to being proactive and from preventing identified risks becoming issues during the, the study. So in a way, even though you may have to spend a bit more time during the planning phase, it promotes the getting it right the first time approach. And I am aware of the fact that many people within the research or clinical development environment may see a QMS as a burden because uh, it represents more paperwork to do without any immediate benefit. But over time, once you've adopted a QMS, it does promote a culture change. Uh, and over time, it becomes second nature to you. And this just becomes what you do on a daily basis. And it also supports research that is sound and gives the regulators some confidence in your research because you would be following a systematic approach and documenting everything. And as we say in GMP, if it's not written down, it didn't happen. Now, not having a quality management system also probably means that existing challenges will remain and lots of people will still see quality as the function of a single person or a single unit or a single department. And that's definitely not right because everyone involved in the clinical development in this case is responsible for quality. Now, with this in mind, the QAQC unit within NCITA had the objective of establishing a quality management system through which we will implement the infrastructure and processes to achieve the objectives we have. Now, as I said earlier, we have three different units. Um, that sometimes we'll have to interact and work together. So it doesn't make any sense that each unit has a completely different system that they will be working under. So we need something that en uh, encourages collaboration. And because all the NCITA members are scattered across the whole country, we also need something that works for everyone and that is accessible to everyone. So we have chosen QPAS as our quality management system. And for these reasons that I just mentioned. Now, QPAS has several modules. So it has a document management module that will ensure that the documents uh, for NCITA are fit for purpose, so that is um, that they are approved. So the, the module will support the approval, the distribution, and the acknowledgement of the documents. And it will also support the management of any obsolete versions or inactive documents. 
and it will provide a secure and central repository for NCTA staff to be able to look for documents, retrieve them, and view them in a secure way according to their permission level. So we also have a people module, so everyone working within NCTA or collaborating with NCTA will be listed uh, and everyone will be given different permission or access levels. Uh, so this will restrict what documents they are able to see. We will have a customers or studies module that will list all the studies that are adopted by NCTA and we will have all the documents associated with the studies linked because all the modules within QPAS are interconnected. We will have an assets module that will list uh, all the equipment that is used to deliver the NCTA studies. So this list will come uh, in the form of an equipment inventory that will specify where that asset is located, manufacturer, model, year of installation, and so on. But it won't just list the equipment, it will also allow you to schedule activities against them, such as calibration, qualification, accreditation, and so on. And for the activities that are recurring activities, it will send you a reminder to tell you when the activity is due again, and it will let you record any outcome of that activity and store any associated documents as evidence for it. We also have a suppliers module, because in any GMP or GCP regulated uh, environment, suppliers of materials, equipment or services need to be assessed, qualified and approved. Uh, following documented practices. So this module will support that. Um, so we will have an approved suppliers list within NCTA. I, and obviously the level of assessment that each supplier will undergo will depend on the risk or the impact of the material or services they supply to, uh, towards the uh, NCTA studies. We will have a CAPA module. And through this module, we will be able to manage all changes within NCTA, uh, either planned or deviations, and also implement corrective actions and preventative actions for any of the modules that I just listed, be it a scanner breaking down or a supplier uh, being rejected. QPAS also has an audit module that will allow us to schedule, plan, implement, and close any audits. And here, when I refer to audits, it, I'm not necessarily talking about a QITC audit. The clinical trials unit may choose also to use this module uh, to perform their monitoring audits or any other audits. And then finally, we also have a training and competence module that will allow us to document uh, all the internal and external training, not just for NCTA staff, but also for any other uh, personnel that may wish to collaborate with us and may have to undergo some sort of training, let's say, for example, to use the repository unit or any other services we may provide. So, some key points from the presentation. So, the QIQC unit is only a few months old, so it really is in its infancy. So what have we done so far? So in terms of a quality management system, we have just installed QPAS, we have configured two of the modules, we are currently performing validation activities, and we will be rolling out the documents module in August. But where will we be in 12 months time? So all modules of QPAS will be configured and validated, and all modules will be rolled out. In terms of processes, so where are we now? We are currently drafting the SOPs to support QAQC aspects of several NCTA studies and defining the processes to establish an MRI core lab. And where will we be in 12 months time? So we will be supporting some of the QAQC aspects of NCTA studies. Uh, the processes for establishing an MRI core lab will be defined by then. And we will also draft processes for adopting studies with other imaging modalities. So Lucy talked about the PET core lab and the support they provide for multi-center PET studies. We are trying to establish an MRI core lab, but there may be other images, Im imaging modalities that don't have such support, such as SPECT uh, studies. So in those cases, NCTA will be able to adopt those studies and work with the subject matter experts uh, with the, of the investigator team to provide the support we can within the framework that we will have established by then. 
And other aspects we are working on, uh, we, are, we want to facilitate the use of radio tracers in clinical trials. So to this end, um, we have conducted, sorry, we have conducted a survey um, of radio tracer production facilities. So we have sent a survey to all the radiochemistry and radiopharmacy facilities in the UK in order to establish an up-to-date overview of the radio traces available for clinical imaging studies. So we have collected information about facilities, equipment, and licenses, range of radionuclides available, tracers they are currently producing, and the idea is that we will use these results to connect investigators and researchers to manufacturing sites to encourage discussions about future clinical studies. So we have received uh, responses from all the pet centers and from more than half of the radio pharmacies. And we have now extended the survey to also include um, commercial manufacturers to get the whole picture of the UK. So thank you very much for listening. If you have any questions, you can either also visit the website or send us an email and to the QAQC unit. Okay, thank you, um, Maithi. Um, so um, I've got um, so one question for you, maybe to begin with, which um, John um, Waterton's asked. Um, so, do you have a priority list? for the different MR biomarkers? Obviously, there's quite a wide range of potential biomarkers, so are you going to have a, a hit list of a top few priorities? So, at the moment, we don't have a priority list, but probably we will start with diffusion, probably. But there, there isn't, at the moment, a priority list as such. So, so quantitative ADC? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, Fine. Um, and John, um, I, I had a question for you. Um, to what extent are we dependent on getting significant vendor buy-in for any of this to work? Um, I, I, I think the vendors are not our, not our friends in this. Uh, vendors are often uh, more interested in proving that their machines are different from each other, that one's better than the other. So uh, I think the best we can hope for, for the vendors is, uh, is uh, benign uh, tolerance. Um, so I think we, if, we want, uh, if we want to make this happen, we have to do it ourselves. Um, and I think anything that depends on the vendors is likely to be problematic. Okay, and um, I've got a few questions. So, so um, Damien, um, I, I know you've got two questions, but maybe we phone mute and ask uh, John your question, and then we, we might move on to some questions for Lucy. But, but maybe if you focus on the question for John first. Sorry, you want me to ask it? Yes, please. Um, so for John, I think you said that academics should innovate and industry should standardise. So do you think the activities of PETs or MR core labs should be based in industry then? Well, I think that differs a bit from, from country to country. But I think within the UK, where we've built our academic infrastructure so much around uh, innovation that uh, it, it's um, we don't want to get academics into a position where they uh, standardize massively uh, across multi centers and then get punished for uh, for not innovating so if the UK is going to continue to insist that everything that happens in a university has to be highly innovative my, my view is that there is there has to be some space for um, non-academic, maybe for-profit, maybe not-for-profit, but separate organisations which can do the heavy lifting without um, uh, having to be innovating all the time. And indeed, in innovation uh, is actually, in some ways, is our enemy. If you want 63 scanners to work the same, the last thing you want is an RA trying to innovate in the middle of it. Yeah. yeah thanks, John. So I'll mute myself. Um, so there's um, a few questions um, for 
um, Lucy. So maybe, uh, Damien, I might come back to you in a minute, but maybe um, Eric, if you want to ask Lucy your question, please. Hi, Lucy. I, I just wanted to understand what your scope is in terms of uh, process and, and various analysis uh, sessions. Like, so what, what would you not accept? Because um, obviously you, can't, you may not want to accept every single study, but what would you not accept? Um, so we've done a wide range of studies. Um, our biggest sort of um, number of clients is obviously FDG um, and they tend to be late phase trials. Um, I think the only time that we've sort of suggested to the researchers that it's probably not worth going through our core lab is essentially for single center or sort of two centers and small numbers of patients. Um, but we've done different tracers, different um, study designs, so dynamic studies, uh, studies for radiotherapy planning. Um, and we're quite keen to take on, we've, we've never had any requests to do non-oncology, um, but we would have no issue with doing that. Um, we have a lot of experience at the, um, pet in the clinical pet center at St. Thomas's of, of brain studies, pet MR. Um, so I don't think we would sort of be a hard no to anyone. Um, but you know, we're happy to receive emails just to sort of, I have asked us sort of, you know, I have a study in development. What do you think? We're always happy to provide advice. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, f thank you, um, Lucy. So maybe um, um, keep keeping on uh, questions for you. Um, Ross, um, do you want to ask your question, please? Um, yeah, thank you very much, James. Uh, Lucy, I really enjoyed your presentation. I, I, I'm really interested in the way that the way you manage uh, pet studies is so obviously applicable to uh, MR imaging biomarker studies as well. Um, so I think there's an awful lot we can learn from from your experience. Um, my question's really quite related to Eric's because um, what what I'm interested in is how much variation there is in MRI in how we acquire the data and how we need to analyze the data, and that I think that has obvious implications for how you go about setting up trials within MR. Um, and how you go about um, writing SOPs to govern your quality control processes to, to manage your, your outputs. Um, so the, the sort of thing I'm thinking of is a dynamic contrast enhanced acquisition, which in the QBI lab we've got a lot of experience of. Um, I expect that would, be, that would have to be handled quite differently to an elastography study. And if you like, the only similarity there is that you're using the same physical scanner but you're using different coils and, and acquisition methods and, and quality control processes and so on. So what I want to understand is, is, is that a different situation to the pet world or do you understand our problem and do you have some advice for it? Because I'm not sure how we as a group could manage a trial like that. And I'm not sure how, say, a core lab could do that. Um, but you've probably got experience of people coming up with like quite novel acquisition processes and you having to manage the quality of that. So I'd be interested in your advice. Um, sure. So um, I have done some studies on the PET MR and I, I do feel for you in terms of the MR and, and how much things get tweaked and changed. Uh, so uh, sort of even on the fly sometimes. So I do feel your pain. Um, in terms of PET imaging, there are variations. So we have basically a sort of minimal accreditation, which we have based on FDG PET because that's the major area that we do trials in. So these don't include dynamic imaging. They don't include unusual tracers. Um, but we have worked, we generally uh have like uh, i guess you'd call them modules so um the majority of our pet centers all just do fdg pet then we have a smaller number of centers that we have accredited depending on the trial so 
Um, for example, we've got uh, the Panorama study, which is an NC to one uh, using Gallium 68. Um, we've done work to harmonize uh, that, which is slightly different to F18 traces. Um, so the sites would be required to do additional work um, to be signed off for that. We've also worked on studies where they've had radiotherapy planning, which requires um, commissioning of the system to make sure that it's basically up to standard um, to match a CT, simula a CT planning scan. Um, and with that, we actually worked with the radiotherapy QA group that um, Maite mentioned. Um, and we have had studies where there's been additional imaging, such as uh, contrast enhanced CT. Um, so I would say the way that we've handled it, it is we've sort of come up with a, well, we expect everyone to be able to at least do an FDG PET. So we get everyone up to that standard. Then we understand that there will be trial specific requirements. And this is why we ask people to contact us early. We have done a lot of work on certain techniques already, but we can then check, you know, have we already worked out a harmonization process for this or do we need to do one? And most of the new techniques will obviously come from a single expert center. Um, often we can also take experience from our own center. Um, so for example, we do a lot of absolute quantification in PET where patients have um, arterial blood sampling um, and there's a whole host of other um, calibration and QC that's required there. And we can take that expertise because we've got a, a great team at St. Thomas's. Um, our radiographers are very experienced and they can help. And we've actually had people come to visit us. We've also gone to other sites for, to train them in certain procedures. And that's also in some ways helped us to work out where are the gaps in knowledge? What do we need to put in our accreditation? Because you can't really take things for granted. Um, and I guess using the expertise within the network to then build up new SOPs um, that we can then apply to the new trials. So I guess almost working trial by trial and having different levels or different modules of, of QC maybe um, might be the way forward. So perhaps not all your sites will be doing DCE um, so you, but you might have one module working towards that and then other centers doing the elastography, but I guess you would have a ba bare minimum of what's your daily QC. Can you acquire a fairly standard anatomical MR as a sort of basic, get people up to that point at least. Thank you. Did you have any, um, thoughts on, on Ross's question? Sorry, did you ask me? Yes, if you had anything you wanted to add. No, I think what Lucy said actually is right. I think you have to make sure that at least every site is complying with certain minimum standards that you have to start with, and then you have to start building from that because I think the different sites, if you visit different sites, they are all doing different things. And at least you, you need some coordination and standardization even at a very basic level, which I don't think is there yet. Okay, thank you. Um, I wonder maybe, Damien, you, you had a question for Lucy which sort of follows on from this a bit. Do you want to ask that, please? Yep. Hi, Lucy. Um, thanks for a great talk. Really enjoyed it. Um, I was just wondering, in terms of <clears throat> the checks that you do regarding protocol compliance, I'm just interested in how good that tends to be and if there are any um, kind of particular aspects that you see discrepancies cropping up with in different studies or if there's anything common that is often discrepant? Sure. Um, so it really depends on the trial. Um, so like I say, we do quite a lot of um, late phase, phase three studies with large numbers of patients and um, those are sort of a different beast to what we're looking at for the sort of translational uh, moving from first in man to a small number of centers. Um, the issues we have with those is a lot of the studies are done as standard of care. So um, 
issues with uptake time, um, not preparing the patient correctly, um, often crop up and we have ways to tackle that. Um, but in terms of these uh, actual research studies where the scans are defined as research, um, centers are very good, they comply, um, they often, you know, if they're not quite sure on things, we do get calls to say, you know, we've got this issue, um, is it okay if we do this? Um, but I would say probably in terms of pet studies, the biggest issue is um, to do with tracer supply. Um, nobody can predict tracer failures. Um, so getting patients at the right center at the right time and getting the tracer there is probably the hardest bit actually. In terms of doing the scans, sites are then very good. But if traces are delayed, you then might end up with delays on the scanner. Most of the centers are doing clinical patients as well as research ones. So if, unless they sort of booked it on the end of the day, you might end up with, we couldn't get the patient on the scanner or the tracer delay um, decayed. Th those sorts of timing issues, really. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and uh, so the question um, from uh, Martin. Martin, do you want to ask? Uh, so uh, do you want to ask you a question? And, and I'm, I'm not sure particularly who's best to answer that. Maybe Matey, uh, but Martin, please ask your question. Thanks. Yeah, I was just wondering whether NC had considered performing standardised MR reconstructions from the different vendors. You know, getting right back to the uh, the raw case space. So I do, not, do appreciate the data volumes and complexity of reconstruction algorithms, particularly when we start getting into, you know, parallel imaging, compressed sensing and, you know, data sharing. So at the moment, we are, we are not there yet. I mean, as I said, the unit is very, very young. So we've only been around for a few months uh, and we are just setting up our processes. So at the moment, we haven't considered going there yet. But I'm not really in doubt for the future. Okay. Thanks. Martin, it might be useful um, actually just to, to jot down a few, uh, if you have some thoughts on that, that, that would actually be quite useful. You know, um, actually, maybe if you jot down some thoughts and send that to me, that, that would be very helpful, actually. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, may, maybe just things, as John's mentioned, like, you know, mm. just getting some VFA data, mm. raw data, you know, and trying to, uh, to look at that or some T2, something at least fairly mm. simple to start with and just see what kind of variability that's introducing. Sure. Okay. It's, it's Eric here. I, I think, Martin, we will try and include as many experts as we begin to develop these MR um, standard, standards because MR is just very challenging. Um, at some point, we'll have to discuss what the primary uh, data would be for storage. Um, I think case space might be challenging, but if you think that it's, it's worth Doing, I don't. I don't think many people will be keeping that case based data. But if you think that we should involve include that, then we'll, we'll do so. Actually, Eric, whilst whilst you're on, um, John, John had asked the question. I mean, I, I can read this out, really, but um, around the. Um, the um, future for NCTA or, or I suppose the future for this sort of um, MR core uh, lab. Um, and John's asking um, thoughts around how we might maintain funding that. Will there be a spin off, et cetera? Do, do you have any thoughts on that? So, again, I think uh, we, John, we've been thinking a lot about what will happen beyond the five year funding period. Um, <clears throat> And in terms of sustainability, there are various discussions um, um, regarding funding, um, how we retain some of that funding within this period uh, to then use that to sustain uh, most of the NCTA activities going forward. So this is it's early days, but it's, it's important as with most of these uh, accelerator or infrastructure funding to, to think carefully about our sustainability which we do. Sure and um, John I think you've you've um, not so much a question but put down a proposition do you want to just um, me mention what you've said and the sort of r rationale behind what, what, what I'm guessing you're you're saying this is a sort of fairly specific um, 
an example of a fairly specific goal that we, that we should consider setting ourselves? Do you want to just talk through what you've put in the, in the chat? Yeah, so uh, from my perspective, the difficult biomarkers are all the intensive variables, the how hots. I mean, measuring tumour size is, is, is not really in scope. And I was just, you, you, you're obviously not going to be able to accredit everyone to do everything. But I would like to feel that any MR scanner coming onto a clinical trial network could produce decent R1s with a 3D variable flip angle across the whole field of view of, of relevance and decent ADCs uh, with a range of B values, using a range of B values between 100 and 1,000. And if a, if a scanner can, can use phantoms to generate that data in a, in a proper QA uh, process, I would have thought they were the kind of center that you would want in your network. And if the data are, uh, rely, are um, consistently rubbish, you might be more reluctant to keep them in. Um. Thank you, um, John. Um, so um, I, th I think we've we've had a good discussion around that, um, th th these areas. Um, is, is any um, anyone um, else who wants to um, make um, a comment or a question? I, I, I just wanted to people have sent things which I haven't asked and see, but I think I think we've sort of covered those points. But has anyone else um, got anything they want to, to say? Perhaps they could use the raise hand function or um, send me a message quickly before I um, uh, call the meeting to a close. Hi, it's Wailup, Wailup Wong. Hi. Hi. Please go I ahead. I just wondered, um, with particular, specifically around PET-CT, as we know, there's a changing landscape within NHS England with PET-CT. And moving forward, we're going to have 13 key organisations with their... Um, partners delivering um, all PET-CT NHS England services for at least the next eight years, I think. And I just wondered, thoughts from the forum uh, with regards to maybe any opportunities there, um, because I'm a keen uh, supporter of um, having aligned uh, scanners, aligned data as much as possible so to facilitate uh, clinical work across England and also to support clinical studies and I just wondered um, thoughts and I just wondered how um, perhaps we can help in this conversation if at all. Great thanks and um, so I don't know um, maybe Lucy and, and Eric perhaps if you have some views on this. Um. Yeah, I mean, uh, while well, this is a this is a very important uh, question. The the starting point was always going to be to uh, look at and seek out and the and the clinical trials that come through uh, to UK institutions. But uh, we also said we'll uh, transition a number of these into into the NHS. So. We are bound by that to to work to the sort of models you're talking about. We haven't done it. Um, it will probably require some additional funding to to get to that level, but I think it's important and we should do it. Um, perhaps once the the changing landscape um, is, is settled down a little bit, it will be the sort of time to to pick up on that. Yes, uh, uh, while, while there is the, op I think there may be an opportunity there, isn't, uh, 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 maybe. Yeah. Uh, Lucy, did you want to add anything? Um, I was just going to um, mention something. So I think Maite mentioned in her uh, talk about how Estonia has a process in place whereby in order to even get reimbursed for PET scans, you have to have done EARL accreditation and they have a similar process in um, the US uh, where centers and they have that for MR as well I believe. Um, I just wonder if this is what we should be pushing for that actually there should be a process in place where there's a minimum standard even for clinical imaging on both MR and SPECT, PET so on. You know we, we have a lot of audit and so on for 
other aspects, but there's no sort of independent check, say, of our scanner calibration or so on for clinical scanning. Um, but I, I'm not sure who would have the resources to, to do that and obviously how it would be funded long term. That's very interesting, Lucy, just to come back, because as you know, with PET-CT for clinical services, we have a standard specification and maybe we can have a, 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 a somehow uh, with a refresh of our um, specification for all our NHS England providers uh, have something there around it to support. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, I think um, I'll now just maybe thank all the speakers once again um, for taking part. Um, and, and thank you to everybody for dialing in. As um, I'm sure many people probably realise that um, th these three uh, webinars that we're holding are effectively replacing the national meeting that we were hoping to have this year, obviously with, with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, that, that simply wasn't possible to have and, and rather than postpone to a possible later date in the year, we elected to have three webinars instead, which effectively cover 95% um, of the content. Uh, so on that theme, there is another webinar planned, that's for the 31st of July, so last day in July, and that's uh, looking at application of imaging and trials. Uh, so there's, there's two clinical applications talk, but also um, there's a talk by Sue Mallet, uh, who's just moved uh, recently, I think, to UCL, um, and getting the biostatistics right. So that I think would be particularly interesting. So if I can flag that, uh, please do look at trying to register for that. That um, already for registration. If you can't um, find that link, please um, do email myself, and I can point you in the right direction. But um, thank you very much for everybody for uh, taking the time to dial in. Uh, thank you to the speakers, and hopefully see you again um, in a few weeks' time at the uh, last of the three webinars. Thank you very much.